Hello friends, welcome to CEC Gurukul Live Lectures. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on Indian philosophy, today we are going to talk on another important topic under the series. Our topic of discussion is theories of error in Indian classical philosophy. Friends, we are going to discuss about theories of error in classical Indian philosophy in detail. And for the discussion, we have with us in our studio, Dr. Ajay Verma. Dr. Ajay Verma is Associate Professor in Centre for Philosophy, School of Social Sciences, JNU. Dr. Verma is a prolific professor and uh, we are always privileged to have him in the studio because he has lots and lots of uh, content with him which is useful for the students. Friends, if you have any question while listening to us, feel free to talk to us through our toll-free number. Our toll-free number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Ajay Verma, once again and would request him to give us in-depth knowledge on today's topic. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you, Gary. Uh, hello viewers, so as uh, already pointed out, uh, today in this lecture we would be talking about uh, different theories of error in classical Indian philosophy. And uh, but, but but before we uh, uh, proceed, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, our discussion on classical Indian uh, on, on theories of error in classical Indian philosophy, it'll be important for us to understand, uh, you know, what exactly is the definition of knowledge, or what exactly do we understand by the term knowledge, uh, with reference to uh, classical Indian philosophy. And in uh, you know in in the background of that, it'll, it'll make more sense to us. Uh, why different kind of you know, theories of error have been proposed by different schools uh, of, of uh, Indian philosophy. Uh, uh, so, so uh, let's begin our discussion you know, by, by, by sort of uh, talking about uh, what are, uh, so to speak, different theories of knowledge, or, or uh, rather, uh, you know, rather than uh, that, uh, what are uh, different definitions of knowledge, or what are the different sort of ways of, uh, of uh, you know, generally uh, understanding the very idea of, uh, of knowledge. So first of all, uh, as pointed out in uh, some of our earlier lectures also, we must uh, you know, uh, know the distinction between uh, a bare cognition and knowledge per se. So as pointed out uh, earlier as well, a cognition refers to mere act of, uh, you know, mere act of kind of registering something through our sense organs. So it's, it's, it's like uh, sort of, you know, uh, in, in a particular situation, some kind of, so to speak, seeing of something happens to us. So, if if uh, you know if if we are uh, if if we uh, lend open our uh, different sense organs, we are gaining some kind of sense data constantly from our surroundings, and that is more or less tantamount to you know cognition of, of things around us. Of course, you know the cognitions could be uh, different kinds depending upon uh, what. Uh, what sense organ is being used? So there could be uh, auditory perception. Some, you know, something could be cognized uh, by hearing it. Uh, similarly, there could be visual cognition of something. There could be visual perception of something uh, when we uh, when we you know see something through our uh, eyes. When 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 you know something becomes available to us uh, in our sight. And so on, and so forth. So, you know, like similarly, sort of, we, we we have smell of things, and uh, since you know, certain things have some characteristic smell, uh, so by uh, by you know the bare act of uh, sort of uh, uh, being able to smell something, we can form the association that uh, something that is associated with the smell must be somewhere nearby. So, cognition is a mere, uh, you know, a, a kind of a sort of very preliminary act of uh, seeing, uh, or you know, or, 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 or sort of you know, very preliminary act of of registering something through our uh, senses. But as we are aware. <coughs> Uh, all cognitions uh, are not uh, correct. All cognitions are not valid cognitions. So at times, uh, uh, it ha it so happens that uh, you know we, we form some kind of judgment in our mind, uh, and uh, that judgment uh, happens to be on a closer examination happens to be or is found to be is discovered to be uh, not correct. 
So, say for example, uh, if if uh, you know this, uh, if, if the situation, if the conditions of of uh, visual perception are are uh, not perfect, then uh, you know if there's a dis if there's a, some kind of a pole at some distance, we might think of, of it. You know, and we might perceive it as uh, somebody uh, under uh, somebody standing at some distance. Or you know, so if if we want to take some of the classical examples, uh, seeing of snake in rope and so on and so forth. But also, you know, one could add here that uh, you know, so at times uh, so these situations of error, you know, uh, could could be could be uh, uh, you know uh, could be uh, life and uh, you know could make a difference between life and death. So, say for example, you know, uh, snake and rope example. If if you if you miscognized. Uh, uh, say, for example, snake as a rope, uh, then you know it could be it could be a sort of you know a, a kind of a question of life and death. Similarly, another example which is not very often uh, uh, cited in in, in uh, scholarly discussions on on uh, theory of knowledge and in philosophy is that uh, at times uh, you know especially in, in ancient times. Uh, mendicants or uh, you know different different saints they would be basically always on the go so they would be uh, traveling all the time they would be walking uh, all the time from uh, one place <coughs> to another and at night they would want to reach uh, the nearest uh, you know place of settlement in the sense that uh, uh, it would be best for them if uh, by you know they spend a uh, night uh, somewhere a little away from the forest in some human settlement so especially if you are uh, in a hilly area in such kind of situations uh, then uh, it may not be so easy to to make a, make a kind of a guess about uh, where could be the nearby uh, human settlement and one good way of finding it out in a Early times uh, was uh, to see if there is uh, smoke coming from somewhere. Now, smoke. If you are uh, traveling in a hilly area, if you are sort of uh, high at uh, you know at, at some height on some hill, uh, you may see some kind of column of smoke rising from somewhere, and that would give you some kind of indication <coughs> that there could be some human settlement, some village uh, nearby, and uh, you know it will also sort of give you some kind of a direction uh, how to regarding how to reach that place. Now, uh, the problem is that. Uh, that uh, uh, you know at times uh, one could think of uh, you know during especially during the time of winters we know that there is also a lot of fog at times uh, uh, anywhere and sometimes we may mistake fog as column of smoke and uh, then uh, and if we reach there we may find nothing over there as a matter of fact uh, since you know it was going to be foggy around that area it would uh, sort of uh, jeopardize uh, uh, the person even more so it becomes very important uh, you know that we have right cognition of things uh, and uh, because you know at times it could be a situation of life and death for us but you know this is from practical point of view uh, there are certain other philosophical reasons as well why uh, you know sort of uh, we wouldn't want to put us uh, into situations of error but as pointed out uh, you know before that we must understand that cognition mere act of seeing a very preliminary act of registering something through our senses uh, is all it you know always lends itself to the possibility of being uh, proven wrong at a later stage uh, whereas as uh, you know we are already aware uh, knowledge especially in uh, as far as investment philosophy is concerned uh, knowledge is defined as justified true belief so so to speak truth is uh, you know is is uh, supposed to be one of the constituents one of the essential constituents of uh, knowledge as such so uh, knowledge is supposed to be a cognition which is known to be true so it is belief it is a belief you know that we might have about something so it is propositional in nature it is of the form of a judgment that we connect to uh, by believing it uh, but at the same time uh, we must have some kind of a justification for it and uh, the third is that it must be known to be true 
And uh, so, you know, um, uh, well, like just true belief, somebody might say, well, why not, uh, you know, we should think that a true belief is, is uh, you know, should be t- considered as tantamount to knowledge. Uh, say, for example, you know, in, 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 in quizzes, in TV, in TV quizzes, uh, for that matter, uh, at times you make uh, a guesswork. Uh, also, for that matter, in some examinations, when you are uh, given multiple choice questions, you do make a guess. At times, uh, you know, a candidate may, a candidate may not know the uh, actual answer to the question, but uh, uh, she, you know, may have some reasons to eliminate uh, some of the possibility as by, you know, reduction ad absurdum, as it's called in logic, by the process, you know, by the method of elimination, uh, the candidate may arrive at a uh, right, uh, you know, answer. But is it, uh, you know, tantamount to knowledge, or for that matter? Uh, uh, you know, you may uh, you may form a particular kind of a belief. Say, for example, uh, merely on the basis of, uh, say, for example, astrology, uh, because you believe in astrology. But you know, or, or for that matter, uh, because you know, it just occurs to you. Because, or maybe you know, sort of, you have a strong intuitive sense that uh, this is what the case is. So, in such cases, it might so happen. That you, what you believe might turn out to be true. Say, for example, uh, you know, you you sort of uh, you may feel uh, sort of very strongly that uh, that uh, it's it's raining in Chandigarh right now, uh, and you have you don't have any evidence for that, but and it turns out to be true. But now, in such cases, you know, you you are you'll you'll just get lucky. So, say for example, t- uh, c- uh, tossing of a coin, uh, you may believe that is going to be had, uh, and it may turn out to be true, and you'll win the toss. But, but you know, the the, the problem here is that you didn't have any uh, proper philosophical, logical justification for believing what you did believe. So, uh, so that's this is uh, you know in very simple terms, in very commonsensical terms, this is how sort of uh, we can understand uh, why uh, justification is also a very important part of knowledge. But but uh, uh, apart from that, now coming back to our discussion at hand. Uh, the 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 idea the the you know the main point that uh, sort of we are, we are trying to understand here is that there is a difference uh, there is a distinction there is an epistemological distinction between uh, cognition mere cognition and knowledge cognition uh, you know could lend itself to doubt uh, first of all so say for example you know uh, you see something as as kind of hazy um, uh, or say for example uh, sort of you know right now there is a lot of smog in delhi uh, things may not appear to you very clearly especially in the morning and in the evenings and uh, when you see something at a distance uh, you may be doubtful about uh, what uh, the 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 object could be so, uh, cognitions, mere cognitions, could uh, you know lend themselves to to doubt, and uh, doubtful propositions, especially in Indian philosophy and, and especially in our tradition, are not considered as tantamount to knowledge. Uh, so, doubt is known as sanshay, and it is uh, you know not considered uh, you know as a part of the domain of, of knowledge. So, mere mere cognition. Could be doubtful. Uh, it could be also uh, probable opinion. Uh, you know, say for example, you could uh, sort of you know, which is not very different from doubt, but uh, but you know, probable opinion uh, is is in something that uh, that sounds more uh, probabilistic, therefore more positive. Whereas you know, being in doubt sounds something uh, more negative. So you may know that something uh, you know is the case probably. So uh, you're not categorical about it, uh, and you say, "Well, this thing could be that," uh, you know, uh, that referring to some some object. Uh, so therefore, cognition uh, could be doubtful, whereas uh, you know, knowledge, if we define it as uh, justified true belief, or you know, even in philosophy, the term used is prama, uh, known through some certain pramana meaning, uh, we have some kind of evidence for it. 
So therefore, uh, you know, it cannot be, so to speak, uh, doubtful. Uh, doubtful, you know, cognition, uh, probably, you know, shouldn't shouldn't count as knowledge. Similarly, probable opinion also should not count as knowledge. Uh, so, when does it count as knowledge? It should count as knowledge only when our cognition is known to correspond to the actual nature of the object. So, uh, when we know that the judgment that we have formed by, by uh, you know, the kind of sensation that we have had or by, you know, sort of what we have registered through our senses and after, you know, registri registering something through our senses, when we form an opinion, when we form a judgment about uh, that, so that judgment, if we know that it actually corresponds to the actual nature of the object, then uh, it, uh, you know, the cognition would be deemed fit to, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of to, to be considered as an instance of knowledge. Now, once we understand that, uh, we would also, it will become much easier to, for us to understand uh, what is, you know, uh, as uh, what should be the binary opposite of it. So, binary opposite of it should, would be uh, error. Error are cognitions which uh, reveal their objects as they are actually not. So, these are certain cognitions which, uh, you know, which uh, don't really correspond to the actual nature of the object. But this is only the negative part. The, the other side is not only uh, an erroneous cognition does not correspond, the judgment based on that does not correspond to the actual nature of the object, but we see it as something else, uh, some, you know, uh, we see it as otherwise. We see the object otherwise, we see the object as what it is not. So, there are, you know, there are, uh, there are two things involved in a situation of error. One is that we fail to see, it fails to reveal to us the actual nature of the object, so abhava of the object. and it shows the object as otherwise. This, uh, the later, you know, this letter, uh, letter characteristic also differentiates it from doubt. In a doubtful situation, we, uh, you know, we don't form a categorical judgment because we are not sure about uh, our judgment. So, we are not sure in that situation that whether, uh, you know, uh, what we cognize or the thing we cognize at a moment, uh, whether, you know, in, in, in the cognition of that thing, we actually have before us the actual nature of the object. So, uh, uh, doubt, uh, you know, uh, is opposed to error because in, a, in error, not only we know something as, uh, you know, as, as what it is not, but we see it as positively as something else. So, say for example, uh, you know, when we, when we see uh, 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 oyster shell as, as, uh, as a piece of silver, so not only in that cognition, in that erroneous cognition, we fail to see uh, the the actual nature of the object, which is oyster, which is oyster shell, but we also see it as something otherwise, something that it is not. So, such situation where uh, object where an object is you know not re revealed in its actual nature in the cognition. And also, uh, it is seen as otherwise. Uh, it is. It is. It happens to be viewed as what it is not. Such kind of situation is tantamount to erroneous cognition. Such cognition would be referred to as error. So now, uh, sort of, uh, uh, we hope that uh, you know you, uh, you 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 would be uh, you would be able to understand the difference between uh, cognition. Uh, erroneous cognition or error and knowledge.
Now, having uh, understood that, another question that might uh, arise uh, in, in one's mind is, uh, why, why should we theorize error? Because uh, error, uh, uh, errors are always uh, temporary. Uh, uh, so, so, and errors also you know, don't happen, uh, sort of we, we don't uh, you know, come across situations so very, very, very often in, in, in our lives. So, it doesn't happen uh, very often with us. We are not mistaken about the the nature uh, of things, uh, you know, very often in our lives. So, these are very temporary uh, situations and these are situations that uh, kind of uh, seldom occur uh, in our lives. So, why should we uh, theorize uh, uh, so much about error? Why is theorizing uh, uh, error, uh, why theorizing error is important? So now, with reference to that, we must remember that uh, philosophy is uh, defined as wisdom of love uh, and uh, defining and seeking knowledge is uh, one of the central pursuits of uh, philosophy. Uh, and uh, given that to be the case, uh, erroneous situations, error, uh, you know, uh, the situation of error uh, provides significant challenge uh, to this pursuit. So, uh, you know, if, if we come across situations of error, then uh, any theory of knowledge should look at it as a challenge. Uh, because if, if, uh, if knowledge is possible, and if knowledge is always possible, is universally possible, then uh, properly speaking, uh, you know, uh, error uh, should not actually occur. Uh, uh, another uh, problem here is that if we know how errors occur, we know the nature of invalid cognition, which helps us understand the mechanism of its generation. So, at this point, uh, you know, we must understand that, uh, you know, when we theorize about error, this is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we should theorize. We should try to explain, uh, you know, philosophically why errors occur at all. Because when we theorize about them, uh, you know, when we theorize the situations of error, we know uh, how errors occur. And uh, when we know how errors occur, we know the nature of invalid cognition. If we know the nature of invalid cognition, it gives us some very important clues regarding uh, how uh, does it so happen that invalid cognitions are generated at all? And if we have some good theory of why or, or what generates uh, an invalid cognition, we would be in a much better position to be able to prevent such situations. So, say for example, if if you know if if we sort of if we have been mistaken about you know some uh, kind of uh, something, uh, uh, you know at resistance, uh, where you know if we have been mistaken about uh, it it being a case of smoke or fog, uh, as pointed out earlier. So then uh, you know sort of if we know why these errors occur, where did we wrongly associate uh, you know sort of what we saw with uh, you know the kind of judgment that we formed, uh, if we know how how errors are generated, where we could possibly go wrong, then probably we would be in a much better position to prevent such errors in future. And that would be, uh, that is, you know, sort of, uh, that that uh, uh, lends itself to reason that, uh, you know, such, such, such sort of, no, such knowledge is uh, very uh, important for us. So, uh, so these are uh, some of the various reasons, uh, you know, that we could think of. Uh, reasons for uh, why uh, uh, one should, you know, philosophically uh, theorize error, why uh, one should, uh, you know, explain uh, the situations of, of uh, error. But you know, from the point of view of uh, sort of pure philosophical discussions, we must understand uh, that you know, there are sort of uh, some very core philosophical uh, sort of uh, issues that are associated with error and uh, we must have a kind of a broad uh, look at that. So now uh, we, we can we can sort of uh, we know we know when we talk about different theories of, of uh, uh, you know, knowledge, uh, you know there are sort of uh, 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 also sort of you know different theories regarding how we are knowledge becomes possible at all, or uh, you know what constitutes knowledge or what uh, what is the actual source of knowledge. Then we realize you know, there are several uh, debates uh, that are associated with uh, with uh, such questions. So say for example. 
there's a group of philosophers called realists uh, they would say that uh, you know uh, sort of uh, whatever uh, uh, sort of sensory experiences that we have it's basically uh, a result of cognition of something that is really out there so it's triggered off uh, by you know some kind of sense data that is being uh, constantly set off uh, from uh, the other side which is uh, which is you know the the world the physical world that is uh, spread around uh, uh, you know us whereas as we are already aware idealist would always point out that uh, you know when we talk when, when we think of knowledge we have nothing but uh, you know our sensory experiences and ideas uh, you know based on that and uh, so whatever we know is basically you know sort of uh, is basically uh, of the form of idea and therefore uh, we can never go outside of ideas uh, and therefore you know we may never know that uh, there uh, could be a, a physical world so to speak an objectively real world around us now as we can see uh, uh you know theories of error would really provide a good challenge before uh, you know realism because uh say for example a realist a realist of the kind of uh, nayikas uh, uh you know would say that uh, world you know appears to us or lends itself to you know to 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 our cognition as it actually is so uh you know world uh, it presents itself to us uh, uh, you know the uh, world presents itself before us uh, in its totality uh, you know in its true nature in its nature as it actually is but then the problem that occurs is that if that is the case then uh you know ca- uh, cases of error uh, should be uh, sh- should should not happen <coughs> <coughs> sorry <coughs> cases of error uh, should not be possible if the world uh, comes across to us as, as it actually is and we cognize it as <coughs> sorry as it uh, actually is so in that case <coughs> excuse me so in that case in that case uh, errors uh, should should hardly happen so uh, so uh, you know what we uh, what we must realize here from the point of view of epistemology is that there would be a tendency uh, there would be a different there would be different kinds of uh, challenges that uh, you know different uh, sort of theories uh, uh you know would have to face say for example you know uh, a, a realist would uh, have to tackle the issue uh, of error in a different way an idealist uh you know would have to explain uh, you know uh, uh sort of a case of error in a different way as a matter of fact uh and and uh, sort of you know uh, when it comes to skeptic uh you know somebody who doesn't believe that uh, knowledge is possible at all uh, certain knowledge is possible at all uh such situations of error you know are a kind of uh, sort of you know, important clues because uh, uh you know most of the time in in you know in in sort of different uh, forms of skepticism uh most of the time the argument that is put forward is uh, what if uh, you know we are dreaming all the time uh what if uh, you know we are in a situation of error all the time so you know uh, what is being pointed out here is that very broadly speaking a skeptic a philosopher who doesn't believe in the possibility of knowledge who doesn't take the possibility of knowledge seriously uh always presents uh, you know arguments where uh, even though uh, ordinarily speaking we know that situations of error are local and temporary what skeptic does is he or she universalizes uh, such uh, such you know kind of scenarios we know that errors are you know error because uh, we 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 you know uh, a cognition becomes erroneous uh, only when we it has been sublated uh, we will we'll come to you know, this point uh, this point is important and you know it's it's used by several 
several uh, theorists of, of, of error. We will we'll come to that point later. But you know, what we must understand here is that uh, a cognition is known to be erroneous only after the sublation of it in the sense that only when we have come to know uh, the, the right nature, the actual nature of things. So, when we have got over our initial erroneous cognition, that we come to know it as error at all. So, in that sense, errors are always local and all errors are always temporary. But what a skeptic does is, a skeptic would always make, you know, sort of would always universalize such issue, you know, such, such uh, instances, would always present the, you know, such, such uh, instances uh, as, as universal, uh, you know, instances as if they, they, this is what is happening with us all the time. So a skeptic, uh, you know, say for example, uh, Descartes, his famous argument we already know. So his argument is, what if we are dreaming right now? But uh, but you know we we know that dreams are uh, you know known to be dreams only when we have woken up. So but but uh, such situations of error are important, are very important tools for uh, skeptics because. Uh, you know the way they throw challenge. Uh, you know before uh, an epistemologist, before you know somebody who believes, uh, you know in the possibility of knowledge. So the the the, uh, the kind of objections that are uh, presented by by a skeptic, uh, you know, are very often based upon situations of error, uh, and uh, you know uh, an argument is created by by suggesting that errors could be happening all the time and we could never be certain that we have got over <coughs> uh, the error or we can never be certain that our cognition right now, even though it seems to be true, is not a case of error. So from this point of view also, uh, uh, the, the errors, uh, erroneous cognition, uh, becomes a very, very important issue for 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 uh, skepticism, for epistemology uh, alike. Now, having understood that, let's now uh, sort of uh, you know proceed with our, our uh, uh, discussion on what are the different theories of of uh, error in classical Indian philosophy. Now, as we are already aware. In, in classical Indian philosophy, also there are some uh, schools of thought uh, who are who who sort of are thoroughgoing realists, uh, and important among them uh, would be uh, Nayakas, Nayavishesikas, uh, also also uh, uh, Mimansakas, uh, both uh, you know Prabhakar and Bhattas, and uh, when it comes to later uh, sort of uh, Vedantins, most of them are also realist. Though uh, you know the term idealism is applied to to uh, Shankara's philosophy by several scholars, but he's he's is not idealist in in you know in the sense of uh, uh, Vigyanvad. Vigyanvad of, of uh, Buddhists, they are idealists of, of uh, you know of a very different kind because uh, they challenge the very notion of objective reality. Uh, there is not something that uh, you know uh, we find in, in uh, Shankara's uh, philosophy. So uh, first of all, uh, one cannot be sure whether uh, the term idealism should be applied at all, and if it should be applied, then it's applied in, in not in the same sense as it is applied for uh, Buddhist Yogacara philosophy. <clears throat> now, having understood that, uh, we also must understand that uh, uh, there are uh, two important uh, sort of divisions when it comes to theories of error. Uh, uh, one, uh, you know, sort of one uh, head that is generally used for, you know, to, to put together certain theories of error put forward by realists is uh, Satakhyati. Satakhyati basically refers to you know theories of error which propound that cognition is of the real. Uh, whenever we cognize something, then that cognition is of something real because if you are a realist, you'll have to account for it because only real can be cognized. Uh, if something that is wrong, not real can also be cognized, then you are leaving scope, epistemology, you are giving epistemological space for you know, the idealist to come in and capitalize upon that. 
because uh, you know what idealist suggests is that there is no outside reality vis a vis uh, which we could verify our cognitions our cognitions are you know incurably uh, our own and uh, therefore there may not be any way of uh, being able to uh, verify them so uh, a thorough going realist would never want to suggest that there could be a cognition without uh, its counterpart being real uh, because as 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 pointed out it would leave scope for uh, for idealism so satkhyati refers to those theories of error which propound that cognition whether in error or in the case of uh, prama is always of the real and though at the same time we also sort of must take care here that this term is also used to refer the theory of error propounded by ramanuja and uh, we know that you know ramanuja's philosophy is called vishisht advait uh, because he is uh, propounding uh, so you know uh, non dualism within a thorough going realist framework as opposed to advait uh where you know as pointed out uh, advaitins you know don't uh, actually thoroughly deny uh the the you know the 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 presence of uh, you know or presence of of an object but you know their take on the issue is very different because you know something uh, apart from the existence of uh, you know the very existence apart from the pure existence of the object everything else according to them can be bracketed out Uh, so they are idealist only in that sense uh, whereas according to ramanuj even brahman is you know real and uh, real also in the sense of physical so uh, he is uh, you know a thorough going realist and uh, his theory of error is also known as satkhyati so satkhyati uh, the term satkhyati meaning error is also of the real uh you know refers to two things it refer you know it it sort of it it, it is definitive uh first of all of a category of those theories of error which propound that cognition even the erroneous one is always of the real secondly this term is also used to uh, you know to to refer to the theory of error propounded by ramanuj but some of the important theories that uh, fall under uh, this category are akhyati the- theory of no error uh, as propounded by prabhakar anyatha khyati a uh, theory of uh, you know uh, 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 you know uh, error being elsewhere <coughs> uh, error you know as cognition of something elsewhere uh there is uh, you know anyatha khyati vad of nayikas viparit khyati of bhattas and also to a certain extent a nirvachaniya khyati of uh, advaitins so uh so but you know definitely categorically and this applies to akhyati anyatha khyati and viparit khyati uh now uh, uh and uh, some of the other theories uh, which you know regarding which we would have a uh, uh, kind of a more detailed discussion later on are uh, you know asat khyati vad of uh, shunyavadins and atma khyati vad of uh, yogachar uh, you know buddhist or uh, buddhist idealist so uh, so uh, you know uh, uh, we would have a look at uh, different these different theories one by one uh, we could you know sort of have a very uh, very quick kind of a look at uh, ramanuja's theory ramanuja be the- you know believes that whenever we cognize something even in those situations when something is cognized as what it is uh, not we actually happen to cognize the thing so say for example uh, even when we see a uh, you know uh, we happen to see a conch shell as silver as a piece of silver silver is actually seen there and since you know is a thorough going realist he believes that silver is actually there in conch shell now this might sound perplexing to us but it'll become clear if we look at his overall philosophical framework where uh, you know he says that uh, everything in the world is composed of the very same five elements and if everything in the world is composed of the very same five elements that means there is everything uh, there is you know something of everything in uh you know everything in the universe so that means the difference between two things 
is not of kind but only of degree so uh, so this way he says that uh, you know there is a bit of silver also in conchial but because of some defect in the situation of uh, error you know in in this in the cognitive uh, apparatus in the cognitive situation because of some deficiency there uh, we don't see the uh, the conchial in its fullness but we only happen to see uh, the silver in it which is its partial nature so for ramanuj situation of error cog, uh, you know uh, cognit uh, uh, an erroneous cognition is tantamount to partial cognition of the actual thing so this is how ramanuj would explain <coughs> how errors occur so we'll talk about uh, you know other theories which are generally uh, put uh, you know under the category which are considered under the category of uh, uh, satyakhyati or cognition even erroneous cognition uh, you know being as of uh, something real we'll talk about it in more detail in our uh, coming lectures we would also look at uh, you know what are the objections that are uh, placed uh, before uh, you know uh, these theories of error by uh, by the other schools of thought so we conclude our uh, lecture at this point well it's no thank you so thank you so much for giving us precious inputs to today's lecture dear friends we believe that you might have a lot of question in mind if you have any feel free to talk to us through our toll free number our number is 18001010430 i repeat our number is 18001010430 now we would uh, like to have uh, some uh, question answer answer round uh, with uh, dr ajay verma so that uh, the students queries uh, are resolved but uh, dear friends we are waiting for your calls so uh, we would like to know we have discussed in detail about the theory of error and uh, you have mentioned also about its importance so we would like you uh, to give us uh, uh, more insight into the topic into uh, why it is very very important why the theory of error is important uh, okay uh, as pointed out briefly earlier uh, the main uh, you know the main sort of things at issue is here is uh, i mean from uh, both from common sense point of view and also in from the point of view of uh, philosophy first thing is you know uh, uh, being mistaken uh, in our notion of something always leads to some kind of loss of the other say for example you know, if you make a wrong prediction about something say for example you know if somebody sort of uh, uh, You, you sort of you, you are uh, planning your day and uh, somewhere you miscalculated uh, somewhere you know say for example sort of you miscalculated about uh, sort of you know uh, it could be whatever it could be you know sort of uh, your way to the office your way to somewhere place where you haven't been earlier so uh, you know being in a situation of uh, you know uh, being uh, in a situation of you know being mistaken about about something is never a happy situation uh, unless you are lucky it would require an <coughs> immense amount of luck that you know you you get mistaken about something and uh, the situation seems <laughs> profitable to you so if, for example you know you lose your way but you land up in some kind of el dorado <laughs> and uh, lo and behold uh, sort of you know you you have uh, sort of so much of wealth for 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 yourself well in 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 sort of uh, 90% of cases 99% of cases uh, such situations are not happy situations so not uh, therefore we should want to you know avoid error and for that we must understand why errors occur at all but from the point of view of indian philosophy this question becomes even more important because uh, in indian philosophy as we know most the uh, you know most the schools when they discuss philosophical issues like uh, uh, you like like definition of knowledge uh, uh, you know or certain other metaphysical questions ontological questions these questions questions are always directed towards one's search for spiritual well-being as a matter of fact uh, one of the one of the important uh, uh, you know one of the important sanskrit uh, sort of uh, saying is that sa vidya ya vimukti knowledge is that which liberates so uh, knowledge is suppose you know supposed to be so, you know something that <coughs> leads you towards liberation so any discussion is ultimately yes, uh, you know, with reference to indian philosophy in the context of indian philosophy is always directed towards ultimately 
is always directed towards some kind of spiritual well-being which is known as moksha, uh, which is known as nirvana uh, in, in, in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, there may be different terms for it in different uh, schools of thought, but this is uh, you know one fundamental uh, distinction that you know you find in, in any discussion in, in Indian philosophy, excepting probably for, for Charvakas. That being the case, most the schools of thought suggest that what is basically preventing us from moksha, from spiritual well-being is our mistaken notion about the nature of the world. There is some problem somewhere in the way we connect to the world around us. Probably our understanding of the world is incorrect. Uh, we, you know, sort of say for example, a Buddhist would say, we think uh, of you know, the world as if it were permanent and then, you know, it sort of we crave for it. Uh, we either want to, you know, if, if it is uh, to our dislike, then we want to kind of shun it. Uh, and if it is to our liking, then, you know, we would always like to keep uh, sort of, you know, the thing with us. But sooner or later, it's going to result in, uh, you know, what they call dukkha because the nature of the world is temporary, uh, what they call shanikvad. Things uh, exist only to go. Things come and go. They are momentary. And once we know the real nature of things, which is that they are momentary, uh, we would have this tendency, uh, you know, of not really clinging to that. Uh, so, you know, this tendency of clinging to the object uh, when, you know, if we think of ob an object as, as uh, you know, as if it were permanent, it is more likely that we would either shun it because it will create displeasure and happiness in us by direct perception or uh, we would have some kind of a craving or clinging to it which is going to later on result in some kind of pain because the object is ultimately going to go. So, knowing the real nature of the object uh, is very important for the purpose of spiritual well-being, for the, for the soteriological purpose. And, uh, you know, when we have some theory regarding uh, the actual nature of something, then, uh, you know, automatically, uh, by default, we also would have a notion of uh, you know, sort of uh, knowing something as what is, it, you know, uh, knowing something not in its true nature. So, uh, this is why if we really care for our spiritual well-being, if this is the goal that we have set for ourselves as, uh, you know, is the case uh, with, with different uh, schools of thought in Indian philosophy, then we must understand, we must have a robust theory of uh, why we understand things, why we happen to sort of, you know, cognize things as what they are not. Because once we have that understanding, that would be, you know, so to speak, uh, you know, that would be uh, the kind of knowledge that would, that is more likely to liberate us, that is, uh, you know, more likely to lead us to some kind of spiritual well-being. So, from, the, from that point of view also, Having a sort of, you know, a good explanation for why errors occur is important, uh, especially also in classical Indian philosophy. So now we would like to ask you, uh, we have discussed these theories, are they applicable, are they really applicable in the real life? Uh, oh yes, uh, I mean in the sense that there could be several examples as you know sort of uh, one of the examples I pointed out uh, and this is you know, one of the examples that you often in some of the, that you find in some of the some of the uh, Sanskrit, you know, classical Sanskrit uh, texts, but not very often used in uh, most of the secondary works. And that example is, you know, sort of seeing something as a column of smoke and then, you know, thereby uh, sort of concluding that, uh, you know, this case of smoke must be a case of fire and, you know, there could be somebody, you know, living in that area and therefore, you know, it could be an area inhabited by human beings and therefore if you reach there, you could be safe. So, 
Uh, such inference is very important. Say, for example, if you imagine yourself being lost in a, in a forest and you are at some height, it will be to you know your immense relief if you find some kind of a column of smoke because it is very likely that somebody you know may be burning wood or something there and it could be you know a sign of human settlement. But then also uh, you know uh, there, there are cases of fog and for the cases of fog if they are localized, they are actually less localized. Uh, fog is generally like spread around you know but but uh, at times even smoke is spread around you know spread out so you must know the actual signs of uh, you know a sort of, uh, of a sign that is associated with uh, smoke and the signs that are associated with fog say for example smoke generally speaking comes out in the form of a column fog is most of the time more dispersed. Smoke disperses after a particular, you know, when it has reached a particular height. So, if you are aware of such distinctions, it's very less likely that you would mistake, uh, you know, uh, uh, fog for smoke. But uh, why it is important from the point of view of real life? Uh, if you reach somewhere thinking that there is human settlement, you might, uh, you know, put yourself into uh, even more danger. So. So, even from commonsensical point of view, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, you nobody wants to be in a situation of error. But it's more important, even more important, uh, for you know, philosophically, from the philosoph from the philosophical point of view, because. Uh, theories, uh, you know, because uh, uh, situations of error uh, uh, kind of, you know, put different kind of challenges uh, uh, before different kind of uh, sort of, you know, theories uh, of, of knowledge. Uh, so, realism, you know, as pointed out, uh, will have to sort of explain if, uh, if, uh, uh, if, if perception is always of, uh, of, of the real then how come uh, you know uh, we happen to know at times things as they are not so that means perception could be uh, you know at times of something that's not real so there there you know realism uh, you know in a certain way directly or indirectly is put at stake their realism you know sort of realism is is challenged uh, and and sort of you know idealism uh, it might seem in such situation uh, you know gets an upper edge over over realism so uh, and you know as has pointed out uh, there are uh, also you know uh, skeptics there are also philosophers who believe that uh, that uh, we can never be sure about uh, you know uh, truth of our cognition therefore we should always uh, suspend our judgment indefinitely we should spare you know suspend our we should always keep any categorical judgment in suspension so uh, but you know it becomes uh, very difficult to live like that when you're never sure that uh, you know what you see is actually what is the case so but you know such skeptics would all would also always take uh, you know sort of uh, uh, help from from situations of error they would they are always sort of you know likely to point out that uh, uh, that that you know since since errors happen and errors look exactly like real cognitions and since uh, there is hardly any distinction between the two at times our uh, dreams are even more vivid than the you know uh, the kind of uh, cognitions we have in our uh, waking uh, in our waking life so therefore uh, uh, therefore uh, you know uh, this distinction between error and uh, knowledge could never uh, be final so this way uh, there are very uh, you know important uh, philosophical uh, issues uh, that are uh, involved uh, you know when we talk about uh, about uh, uh, erroneous cognitions uh, or you know or, or the possibility of error so now we would like to ask you we have uh, talked about these theories in context mm. to india mm. are they applicable to the western world also uh, in probably not in the same manner when you talk about western philosophy you know dominantly the discussion is uh, uh, you know regarding uh, giving up sort of giving some kind of an impeccable definition of knowledge uh, and uh, you know there uh, in, in western philosophy uh, the most celebrated uh, and, and uh, you know criteria is uh, what is called jbt criteria 
where knowledge is uh, defined as justified uh, true belief uh, and, and there is there's, there's any amount of discussion that has uh, taken place uh, in, in uh, western epistemology, western theories of knowledge uh, on you know on, on this issue. Uh, but uh, you know uh, when it comes to theories of error uh, uh, there are not uh, sort of you know there is not much or a lot of discussion or uh, you know sort of uh, this is not it does not form a very 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 important part of the discussion uh, whereas in Indian philosophy uh, is, is uh, I mean almost all the schools of Indian philosophy including for that matter Charvakas who do not propose any theory of liberation. Even they have a theory of uh, error about which you know we would talk later on in more detail. So there is no school of Indian philosophy which does not uh, explain uh, why errors occur at all. There is no school of Indian philosophy which does not uh, have some amount of discussion on uh, on on, uh, on erroneous cognition. And this is uh, you know this this uh, uh, this part of you know this domain of discussion. There is a separate label for that. Uh, this is called khyatiwad. There is no such, uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, there is no such separate uh, branch, you know, that uh, sort of that domin no dominant branch of, of uh, you know, such such uh, discussions or such study as far as uh, Western philosophy is concerned. So it's not a dominant part, at least, of uh, Western philosophy where uh, uh, you know uh, importance is given to certain other uh, uh, issues. And definitely, thank you. So, thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, in-depth knowledge on today's topic. And uh, we believe that we are going to discuss these uh, 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 theories in detail in the forthcoming sessions. Yes. So, what are the remaining theories we are going to discuss? Oh, there are several of them. Uh, so, we, you know, we might begin with uh, you know, those theories of error which are put under the category of satikhyati, uh, meaning uh, those theories of error where uh, you know it's, it's it's believed that cognition is always of the real, even in erroneous cognition. Uh, what is seen is actually you know was in a certain sense there. So uh, since you know, this, these theories uh, should be of more interest to us because uh, you know it, 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 it sort of, uh, one would one would get curious how one could uh, sort of you know really prove that even in an erroneous situation uh, it is uh, something actual that was seen. So we could you know into that discuss uh, uh, you know akhyatiwad, anatha khyatiwad, viparit khyatiwad, anirvachniya khyati. And, and then later on we could discuss uh, Charvaka's theory of error, uh, Asat Khyatiwad, which is you know theory propounded by one uh, sort of sub school of Buddhism, namely Shunyavad, Atm Khyatiwad, which is you know another theory proposed by another uh, you know sort of sub school of Buddhism, namely uh, namely Yogachar or Vigyanvadins. So there are sort of several theories of error, and uh, we would be uh, you know looking at them in, in detail in our forthcoming lectures. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. And dear friends, we believe that you have discovered as well as we have learnt a lot from today's session. If you have any question or if you wish to give your feedback for this particular lecture, then feel free to write to us at info.cec at nic.in. We would like to have your queries and next time when Dr. Ajay Verma visits our studio, we'll try to give answers to your question. Today we are taking your leave with a promise that we are going to meet again very soon and would be continuing our discussion further. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Once Thank again. you very much.